It's final sitting day of the fortnight. Let's bring in our Thursday political panel. Liberal Senator Holly Hughes joins me here at Parliament House and Labor Senator Jenny McAllister is uh, zooming in remotely. Thanks both of you for joining us. Good afternoon, Jane. That's a pleasure, Jane. Look, I just want to start with this news that uh, has broken in the past hour about the ACT going into lockdown and what implications that has. Parliament is due to rise uh, today. There's a week-long break before Parliament returns for a fortnight. Um, just starting with you, Holly Hughes, since you're in the building, what advice have you been given about what happens now to the, uh, you know, Parliament House and the pro progress? Well, like you, we're all sort of still learning as it's going along. It's obviously very new information. Uh, from a Senate's perspective, we'll still be here until we rise, which is normally around 5 or 5.30 this afternoon. I haven't heard any changes to that as yet. Uh, because of the way that a lot of the states were operating with quarantine anyway, the vast majority of us were all planning to stay uh, and work here next week uh, because a lot of, uh, of my colleagues, if they were going to go home, they were, would be going into two weeks of quarantine. So they couldn't actually go home uh, and then return back to Canberra. So it's a seven day lockdown. It's one case. It's obviously everything's unfolding. Uh, it's a little bit too early to make a call on whether Parliament will resume uh, the week after next. But it's you know, so it's too early to call it off because if in seven days it's under control, uh, and Canberrans are very good at following the rules. Mm. So they've also got a really high vaccination rate. Uh, you know, if you look at the national average, they're at well over 50% on first dose and coming up on 30% that are fully vaccinated and their vulnerable cohorts are in the 80 and 90% uh, fully vaccinated. Yeah. So uh, it's certainly, you know, from a from a position of strength, uh, Canberra's in. So if it's, hopefully it is just seven days and uh, it's under control. Yeah, we're a pretty compliant bunch here in the capital. But Holly Hughes, I just wanted to ask you, there are some reports that um, the RAAF is chartering flights to not evacuate, but I guess get pollies out of Canberra back to their states. Do you know what, is that on offer? Have, have MPs taken up that as an offer? That is certainly news to me. I've heard absolutely absolutely nothing around that at all. all so right. I'm, I'm not sure where that's coming from. And certainly the vast majority of colleagues I've spoken to uh, are all staying, are staying here. OK, well, Jenny McAllister, you're actually quarantining in Canberra at the moment in anticipation of joining uh, your parliament, you know, in person in just over a week. Have you heard any update from the Labor side about what actually might happen? I think we're waiting for advice from the presiding officers. Our general view, of course, has been that the parliament should sit whenever it can, uh, as long as it is consistent with the health advice. We think that at a time like this, it's actually incredibly important that the government is subjected to scrutiny. Um, but that said, I guess we'll wait for, the, wait for the advice from the presiding officers. I imagine that they are working through the guidance from ACT Health as we speak and just looking to come to some landing about what is possible for the parliament. OK, would Labor um, sort of um, be in favour of pushing parliament off should this lockdown have to be extended? So obviously not returning in, in just a week's time as expected at the moment? As I said, our preference has always been for the parliament to sit whenever possible, when the health guidance allows it. Right now, we haven't um, got a lot of clarity about what the implications are from this morning's decision for the way that the parliament operates. Mm -hmm. I think we're just going to have to wait on the presiding officers for that one. OK, well, let's talk about the Murrahuppin family. The High Court this morning, as we were just discussing with our previous guest, um, has effectively closed one legal avenue for this family as they fight their extradition. Holly Hughes, uh, this is an unusual case because there's such an, a, a massive amount of public and political support for this Tamil family to stay. The town of Biliwilla in Queensland wants them to stay. Is it time for the Immigration Minister to just intervene and issue this family with a more permanent visa arrangement? The decision today has followed a series of decisions and upheld those decisions across a variety of tribunals and courts and out of the Department of Home Affairs originally. So the decision today has just upheld what's been uh, running through the legal process. But as your former guest has said, and as the minister has said, there are still other legal avenues that are being pursued. So I think it's it's prudent that we're all very careful around this and not make too much commentary. But the minister has been very clear from the outset that he's going to wait until those legal avenues are exhausted before he will take on any personal decision making around that. Yeah, I mean, the family's um, been in detention though for three years. Um, a bridging visa has been issued to um, the three of the members to stay for an extra few months. Is the minister just kicking the can down the road though by waiting for the legal processes to be, to, to come to a conclusion? 
No, absolutely not. And it's an appropriate thing to do when there's legal cases underway to let them play out is absolutely appropriate and not interfere in the in the legal system and the legal processes. That's not his role. His role uh, when he's come into this was to oversee that process until it's finished and then will be the ultimate decision maker depending on where they land. All right, well, Jenny McAllister, the Labor Party has made it very clear that it believes this family should be allowed to resettle in the town they once called their home, Biloela. Uh, are there legal options running out, though, given what the High Court has said today? Look, it's really hard to see what the Minister is waiting for. The ball has been put pretty firmly back in the Minister's court this isn't just a matter of legal concern. There are human implications here. There is a community in Biloela that loves this family, that wants them returned home. Our view is that the minister should use the discretionary powers that he has and give them the support that they require to go home to Bilo. Would you be supportive of this family being issued a temporary protection visa or a safe haven enterprise visa? Because these visas the Labor Party has previously opposed as a policy, but they are on the table potentially for the Murahapan family. I think it's really up to the Minister to chart a pathway home for this family. There are obviously lots of technical options, but at the end of the day, Alex Hawke is holding the pen. He is in a position to make a decision about this family. I think the whole Australian community is quite invested in their well-being. The community at Biloela wants them back. As I said, it is hard to see what the minister is waiting for. Well, I mean, it's interesting because it's a, I suppose there's a question of policy here, Jenny McAllister, because Labor's policy echoes the coalitions, which is that nobody who arrives by boat can ever be resettled in Australia. And we know the two parents arrived by boat. The two children, of course, were born in Australia. So the, on the question of sort of precedent here, why would an exemption be granted to this, uh, the Murahapan family? I think the point we've made is that the Minister has discretion for a reason. This is a family that has been in the community, that was well established in the community of Biloela, and the community wants them back. It's on those grounds that we are calling on the Minister to use his discretion. Yes, the migration system is a complex policy area, but there are human dimensions. And very clearly, this is a family that is in a position to make a real contribution to the Australian community overall and to the community in Biloela. We think it's time for the Minister to use that discretion. This has gone on long enough. And what do you think about that argument, Holly Hughes? Is this a unique case that should be given an exemption, an exception to the rule? When you're talking about, as Jenny said, complex uh, migration policy areas, uh, there's legal avenues, I just don't think you can start to pick and choose. You're right, Jane, when you make the point about what precedent you want to set. And we do need to make sure that there's a consistency because that's how it's fair. And so by going through the legal avenues to ensure that they're all covered off before the minister intervenes, I think is the most appropriate way forward. OK, so I want to cover up on a few issues that have kind of dominated the week in politics. And one is this uh, debate going on about uh, businesses who want to mandate vaccines for their workers. Of course, this is assuming once supplies come on board and eligibility is expanded. Just sticking with you, Holly Hughes, um, there seems to be a bit of frustration that the federal government won't step in here and either provide the kind of legal protections that companies need. Is it fair to just leave them exposed here and asking them to navigate the fair work legal system? But at the end of the day, this is you're talking about something that's going to fall under health orders and these can be issued by the states and states can mandate via their health orders the vaccination. The Commonwealth has always approached this that it's a, a a voluntary scheme. We obviously want to provide as much for people to be vaccinated. We're encouraging people to get vaccinated. It's the only way that we're really going to get out of this is by high vaccination rates. Uh, and we're seeing them now increase exponentially, not only the first dose, but as people are getting that second jab. We've got our third vaccine coming online, the pharmacy rollout. This is all seeing exponential increases. But at the end of the day, like the lockdown we're seeing in Canberra today, this is all issued under state and territory based health orders. And that will actually provide the protection under federal work legislation. Mm. So what we need to see is if that states want to mandate it outside of specific industries, but make it a blanket health order, individual states can do that in the same way these individual states are using health orders to shut borders and, and have lockdowns. So is the Commonwealth also concerned here, though, about a potential perception issue that if the Prime Minister gives backing to businesses to make vaccines mandatory, then that would somehow kind of erode faith in this voluntary program, Holly Hughes? 
Look, Australians have always had a fantastic record when it comes to high vaccination rates. It's never been something that we've considered. It's been absolutely appalling, some of the vaccine hesitancy that's been encouraged, uh, particularly if you look what's happening in Queensland with their Chief Health Officer and some of the language that's been used, some of these commentators that you see out and about. The vaccine hesitancy, the brand shopping, uh, is mm. appalling. But Australians do have an incredibly good track record when it comes to vaccinations. We're seeing people coming to the table now and I think that's just going to continue to increase and I think Australians are starting to see that and we've, we've heard from Gladys that she's looking at things in New South Wales that if you have been fully vaccinated things will start to open up for you. Yeah. So there's the motivation and Australians I think will respond to that very, very quickly. Yeah, it is a big incentive. Jenny McAllister bringing you in. Are you comfortable with uh, companies being left to their own devices to navigate the, the legal system and mandate sort of business by business uh, vaccines for workers? I think we need to acknowledge the situation that working people are facing. The reality is that there are not enough vaccines, there are not enough appointments. And Jenny, so that's not there true. There's more AstraZeneca than we know I'm what sorry, to do Jenny, with them. Can we stop yeah. talking? Well, but rollout, stop talking it down. Argument. The rollout is ramping up, but we've heard this argument, of course. But, but yes. this is the issue. People are scared and think that they can't get a vaccine. There is plenty of AstraZeneca, and the Labor Party need to stop saying that there's not enough supply. That is actually a non-issue, sure, and that is why people vaccine, are hesitating. Sure, but we know is preferred for over 60s, so for people under 60s. A lot of them are waiting for Pfizer supplies to come on board, which we know that they will over the next few months, everything going to plan. But Jenny McAllister, just on that issue of um, companies being given the power to mandate vaccines. Um, sorry, Jane, I, it's regrettable that Holly chose to speak over the top of me. Um, I think that um, it's kind of premature to talk about mandates, isn't it? when it has been so difficult for people to get vaccinated. There's news out today that in one of the uh, aged care facilities in the Hunter that's navigating an outbreak there, only 30% of the staff have been vaccinated and the centre management there are saying it is because it has been difficult for staff to get access to vaccine. And so my preference would always be to work with those people in the community who want to get vaccinated. That is the vast um, majority of this Australian population. We should be giving clear communication about the vaccine, clear guidance and support for these workforces to get vaccinated. I'll say also that I think it would be smart for businesses to be brought into a conversation with the union movement. You have the leaders of Australia's union movement out there on the, in the papers today offering their support for a conversation of that kind. We do best when we work together. I think that it would be helpful for the Commonwealth Government mm -hmm. to start taking some of these offers up and actually starting to navigate a pathway for more collaborative processes uh, within the Australian Federation. All right, Jenny McAllister and Holly Hughes, I'm going to have to let you go because, Holly, you need to actually get to question time in just a few minutes' time. But thanks for your time today.